All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Standard. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Petabridge, and we're the company behind Aka.net. But today we're going to talk about .NET 7 in general. So .NET 7 just came out last week, and one of the major improvements that's included in it is a feature known as Dynamic Profile Guided Optimization. The performance improvements we've measured so far in Aka.NET's benchmarks are tremendous. And the best part about .NET 7 PGO is that it really just takes one line of XML to enable inside your applications. All .NET developers should be taking a look at this. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive into some of the performance numbers that we've seen so far. So the first is Remote. Now this is the single point of bottleneck for our networking system inside Akka.net. This is how quickly we can exchange bytes and serialize messages over a single connection. Every Akka.net cluster has several Akka remote connections per node. So this is an important figure for us. But .NET 7 with PGO enabled was 33% faster than .NET 6. That is a pretty significant uh, quality of life improvement for a lot of our users who are building really large network systems that way. On top of that, Akka.NET 1.4 was 20% faster when using in-memory messaging than .NET 6 was. So this is another big improvement. This is really helpful for when you have messages that are all being sent within the same process. So that's a big performance improvement as well. However, the biggest improvement that we saw was the new version of Akka.net, which uses a couple of newer APIs that allow us to reduce the amount of context switching our actors have. Akka.net 1.5 on .NET 7 with PGO enabled was 75% faster than Akka.net 1.4 on .NET 6. So this is the configuration developers who care about performance are using today with Akka.net is 1.4 on .NET 6. Well, the new configuration you can use, 1.5 on .NET 7 with PGO, is gonna be a 75% improvement without you having to change any of your code. This is essentially a free lunch provided to you by our framework and by the changes to .NET itself. So let's talk a little bit about what PGO is in the first place and why it matters and how it works. Okay, so what is PGO? Well, PGO is short for Profile Guided Optimization, and this is a general practice that compilers use to collect data about how an application executes. Now, that's not strictly speaking just the application's code. That might include details such as what libraries it loads, uh, what type of environment it's running in, and so forth. And the idea is to use this information to adjust the low level symbols that are being produced and executed by the operating system in order to try to help the application perform better. So there's two flavors of PGO that are used by .NET. The first is static PGO. This analyzes the program and gathers data when it's running, but the optimization decisions are made ahead of time. This is used to help do things like reduce cold start times, for instance. It can also be used to do things like optimize the performance of specific libraries that are shared. So for instance, you might configure some of the standard libraries in C-sharp or F-sharp uh, using static PGO ahead of time. Dynamic PGO is what's really new and important in the .NET 7 release. This allows us to not just analyze a program while it's running, but also to make optimization decisions about how it's running in real time. And so this allows the just-in-time compiler to make bets. And if those bets succeed, it'll keep them in place. If those bets fail, the just-in-time compiler might try to do something else. So there are some trade-offs involved in how this all works. Uh, static PGO is enabled by default. And like I mentioned earlier, this is used to help reduce cold start times or to help optimize shared libraries. And you can really see the benefits from this in environments like serverless, for instance. This will go ahead and help make sure the cold start time for one of your you know, uh, serverless web functions is lower than it used to be. So that way you don't have that high 99th percentile latency the first time a function gets invoked. Dynamic PGO is much more useful for applications that are heavily loaded and are you know, essentially trying to achieve low latency processing. Now, .NET 7 was not the first version of .NET to have dynamic PGO. That would be .NET 6. But dynamic PGO was significantly improved in .NET 7. And in fact, I'll link you to the .NET 7 release notes and you can compare just how much better dynamic PGO is in .NET 7 than it was in .NET 6. So the trade-offs with dynamic PGO. The biggest trade-off is going to be that the just-in-time compiler is going to work much more frequently and much harder with PGO enabled. 
So I took the data from our ping pong benchmark with PGO enabled and with it disabled on .NET 7, and we can compare what the total amount of JIT overhead looks like using this data. So on .NET 7 without PGO enabled, we ran for about two seconds total of cumulative just-in-time compilation. Uh, some of that was the foreground compilation. This, uh, this is what happens when your process is starting up, for instance. And then the rest of it was tiered compilation, which happens asynchronously on a background thread. And so the, also the total amount of CPU time without PGO enabled was about 0.5% of the total amount of CPU this process used. With dynamic PGO enabled, we increased our cumulative JIT time by about 30%, up to 3.1 seconds. And you can see here that both foreground and background JIT are more expensive. On top of that, we more than doubled the amount of CPU time we're using to about 1.1% total. And this is pretty much in line with what you'd expect with a, a just-in-time compilation configuration that's going to be making a lot more runtime decisions than it used to. This is the cost of enabling PGO. The benefits of PGO, on the other hand, I think vastly outweigh the cost for our use cases. So I'm very much going to be enabling it by default in any of our high throughput, low latency applications going forward. And here's how you actually do enable it. You go ahead and set this tiered PGO property to true inside your C-sharp and F-sharp project files. Uh, you can also set it via an environment variable if you want. Those same release notes that we link to, I will also show you how to do that. But this is probably the easiest way to do it, just to include it as a property of your projects. And this goes, by the way, in the actual programs that you're running, not in the libraries they use. This is a, as you, you know, may have guessed, this is a just-in-time compilation issue. So that's something that's going to factor into the application when it runs, not into the library when it's originally compiled. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the figures from our remoting benchmark that I mentioned earlier. What does that look like? In .NET 6, Akadot Remote was achieving a throughput of, we'll go ahead and call it 330, 340,000 messages per second across a single connection. And that's pretty good. Uh, we made a lot of, we, we actually made a lot of improvements to Akadot Remote over the life cycle of Akadot at 1.4. And this is sort of what where our baseline performance is as of Akadot at 1.445. Well, in .NET 7, we improved our baseline performance up to about 360,000 messages per second. So, you know, that's about a 10% increase. Um, so that's not too bad. But with .NET 7, with PGO enabled, we're doing about 450,000 messages per second. And that's a 33% increase over .NET 6. So that's a significant performance improvement. And again, all this with just a little bit more JIT overhead and adding one line of XML to our project file. Uh, the juice is definitely worth the squeeze here, in our opinion. The next thing we should take a look at, because this is where data starts to get a lot more interesting about what can be dynamically PGO'd versus what can't. And when I say that, I mean, what sorts of things can the just-in-time compiler actually optimize at runtime versus what is it going to have more trouble with? We can actually see a divergence of that data in our in-memory benchmarks, which allow us to take a much closer look at the way two different types of actors are implemented. One which can be uh, essentially is more PGO friendly and one which is less PGO friendly. So let's go ahead and take a look at that data too. All right, so this is an example of our ping pong benchmark in .NET 6. And so this is measuring, unlike the remote ping pong benchmark, which you know, involves IO, uh, this is just measuring the performance of actors sending messages to each other inside a single process. So this is all being done in memory. There's no serialization. And this is how actors normally message each other by default in most Akadata applications. Now, the peak performance we're getting in .NET 6 is roughly 58 million messages per second. Uh, this value on the left throughput, this correlates to the number of messages an actor can process before yielding on the thread pool. The lower the throughput, the greater the amount of context switching you're going to have. But the trade-off is, is that when your throughput gets higher, you're going to start running into other issues like thread starvation. So you're going to begin to have diminishing returns the higher your throughput gets. Uh, by default, the throughput in Akka.net is 30. That's kind of the happy medium for most use cases in Akka.net. Although this value, as you can see here, is configurable. Now, we have two different actor types here the actor base and the receive actor. 
You can see that the performance is pretty comparable here between them. I think the max value for actor base is 58 million. The max value for the receive actor is, let's see, just about 56.5 million messages per second here. So these actors implement a couple slightly different constructs. And this is gonna play a big factor into what their performance looks like when we turn on dynamic PGO. So this is the actor base. This is the most simple actor base type in Akka.net. Most software developers use the untyped actor, which is like one layer above this. Uh, and it's not much more than this is, but the actor base is the absolute most primitive base type in Akka.net. And the way the actor base processes messages is you have to override this receive method here, where we use something like a switch statement, or in this case, we're using if statements uh, to determine what type of message is what. And then you have to return a Boolean indicating whether or not this message was properly handled. Uh, so this actor does not have a lot of frills to it, and it's very bare bones. If we compare that to the receive actor, which has a nice strongly typed interface where you specify delegates for handling these messages, this actor has a little bit more going on behind the scenes. Now, we should mention that we built this actor before C Sharp 7 was introduced. So there were no switch statements and pattern matching available at the time we defined this actor. So we went ahead and created our own little reflection-based engine, which uses uh, the delegate compiler and a couple of other code emission tools to really efficiently cache all these delegates so we're not constantly paying for allocation overhead and so forth each time we process messages that are sent to one of these receive actors. So this implementation detail is not very noticeable in the .NET 6 performance figures so far, because you'll see actor base and receive actor are pretty close, but this will be a much bigger factor when we introduce PGO a little bit later. So let's take a look at the .NET 7 numbers with and without PGO for these two actor types real briefly. So on .NET 7, so on .NET 6, we were topping out around uh, 58 million messages per second, I think was the max. We're topping out around 64 million messages per second here. So that's kind of the peak performance. So that's still a roughly, uh, we'll call it eight or 9% improvement. Uh, however, if we take a look at, let's see, dynamic PGO, here we go. If we take a look at dynamic PGO, we're doing about 70 million messages per second. So funnily enough, the difference in improvement uh, for the in-memory messaging isn't as significant as it was in our remoting benchmark. And I suspect the reason why that is, is there's actually a lot less to optimize here. This is a much simpler set of tools than what we were working with over Akhenat Remote. So there's just fewer opportunities for a profile guided optimization to actually do any work here. So that's what I strongly suspect is happening. Now, if we take a look at our graphs, so I went ahead and I plotted some of the raw values from each of the different throughput runs to kind of demonstrate what the distributions look like for the receive actor versus the actor base throughput. So this is what that graph looks like in .NET 6. You can see that the receive actor, which is the green dotted line, uh, frequently overtakes the actor base in terms of its throughput here, meaning that these two values don't really diverge very much. The performance differences between the receive actor and the actor base uh, aren't really divergent or differentiated. And we kind of see that's also the same thing that's going on with, with the actor base uh, versus receive actor in .NET 7. Minus this one outlier at the very final run here, the actor base and the receive actor's performances are pretty comparable. There's no real clear divergence here. But when we turn on PGO, one of the things that you'll notice, minus that one outlier at the 400 throughput line, is that the actor base is consistently faster than the receive actor is. And the reason why that is, is because the constructs that we use, the expression compiler and reflection.emit, to help make the receive actor fast, those clever mechanisms we came up with back in the .NET Framework 4.5 era, so this is like 2014, 15, we came up with that. Uh, those clever techniques are effectively defeated by the optimizations that profile guided optimization can come up with. Uh, essentially, there's no point in having these really clever hacks in an era where the just-in-time compiler can do it better. So that's what we're observing here. 
Now, as a bonus, I went ahead and pulled out the figures from Akadon at 1.5, which is our new version of Akadon that we're working on. It's still currently under development. But one of the big performance improvements we made to Akadon at 1.5 is we're using some of the newer threading APIs uh, that aren't available in .NET Standard. These are only APIs you can find in .NET Core 3.1 and later. Uh, we are using one of these APIs to reduce the amount of actor context switching, which is something that'll naturally help increase its throughput. We're doing just under 70 million messages per second without PGO enabled here. When we add PGO to the picture, we're now able to hit speeds of up to 100 million messages per second. Now, why might that be? I strongly suspect one of the other factors that's going to influence uh, how effective PGO is, is actually going to be issues like context switching. I think it's a lot easier for the PGO to optimize code that is not uh, code in state that's not frequently being context switched back and forth. So you'll see that the values for <laughs> the values for Akadon at 1.5 are very high, even starting at around a throughput of 15, which is lower than what we normally use. So this is a pretty tremendous performance improvement compared to what we had before. And I'm very excited to see what Akadot Remote will perform like uh, with some of these other benefits from reduced context switching as well. So a couple of key takeaways about .NET 7 and PGO. The biggest issue is gonna be with legacy code that used to be performance optimized, such as Aka.net itself. Uh, this legacy code that uses some of these older performance optimization tricks that were designed to work around uh, shortcomings with the CLR itself, those tricks are a dead end and are probably obsolete in the era of dynamic PGO. We would be much better off rewriting this code using simpler constructs that the PGO system can optimize instead. That would probably be the way to go about this. Uh, so it's worth revisiting some of that older code that uses these clever performance hacks from years ago and rewriting it to use simpler code that uses built-in uh, native language constructs. Uh, the JIT is going to be able to work with those much more easily than the clever code that we have now. So that's something that we're going to need to take a look at in the Akadana project itself. Uh, but for the time being, for your own Donna applications, if you're writing apps that weren't really leveraging this sort of stuff in the first place, you should go ahead and turn on PGO and see how much better it runs using some benchmarks or using some, uh, let's say, profiling tools like Perfview, which I mentioned in our previous video. So thank you very much for sticking with us. And if you like these sort of talks about uh, improving the performance of your .NET applications and learning about the details of Akadonet, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you.